I want to look this morning at verses 16 through 19. And the subject discussed there is sanctification. It's a big word, but a very important one. And I pray, God willing, I'll get opportunity to explain it. But before we go down that avenue, can I ask you a very simple question? What is the number one priority in your life? I can see you're all looking now. What is the number one priority in your life? There's a verse in Hebrews 12, which answers that for me. Verse 14, it says, Pursue peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. That last piece makes me sit up. Holiness or sanctification is not an option for the more serious Christian. I hope to show you that when you became a Christian, you were made holy. And that as a Christian, your whole life's business, till the very day when you're taken by Christ into God's presence, is to pursue, notice that word, it always strikes me, to pursue, chase after, holiness. What's your number one priority? I'm sure you threw a lot of ideas in there. But ultimately, we're occupied with in life. Yes, your number one priority should be holiness. Sanctification. Defined like this. The ongoing supernatural work of God to rescue justified sinners from the disease of sin and conform them to the image of his son. Holy, Christ-like, and empowered to do good works. If you want a simple picture of what sanctification is, it is to become like Jesus. It's to become like Jesus. And for that reason, I want to go into these four verses this morning and draw out some information which will help us understand this and encourage us on this life pursuit of holiness. We're going to begin by looking at Jesus' sacrifice. We're going to listen to Jesus' <coughs> prayer. And then we're going to understand that we have been commissioned by Jesus to be holy in a sinful world. Let me see if I can help you tease these things out. I, I normally take the verses in the order they come, but this morning, because I'm often too long-winded and don't get to my third point, I'm going to start with what is the third point in the passage, because everything hinges on it. And if all I get to communicate this morning is what verse 19 says, then I've had a good morning. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. It's actually just the first part of that verse. If anybody's got an ESV, they change the word sanctify there to consecrate. It's a valid translation. But it maybe helps you understand the place of consecration or holiness in Christ's life and in ours. Jesus is talking to his father. And in talking to his father, he sets us incredible examples in how to pray. It's not just repeating a few words everybody says. It's actually talking to a person in a relationship. And it involves argument. Now, argument might be a bad word because that suggests, you know, a fight. No, no. Biblically, what you'll find, whenever somebody is praying in the Bible, they will always bring an argument based on what God has said. And that's how we are to pray. Somebody asked me this week, how do I know to pray in the will of God? Make me sit up and think, but it really is just using God's word. Taking back to him what he says. You know, you children, I'm sure you've had times with mum and dad 
when when they've promised something and it's not happened, and you've used that little phrase, haven't you? You said. Now, God is our Heavenly Father. And Jesus sets the example here of going to the Father and saying, you said, and expecting him then to fulfill what he said. For their sakes, I consecrate myself. I sanctify myself. All sanctification or holiness is based on the work that Jesus did. And for that reason, if you ever do knock dust off a book of theology, you'll find sanctification has two primary aspects. There is what is called definitive sanctification and progressive sanctification. Definitive sanctification is that moment in time when you come to faith in Christ and you are justified by faith, and as a result, you have peace with God because your sin is covered, because you're in a new relationship, your hope is established, not on your own merit, but on his. And that's possible because he consecrated himself. He gave himself to make it possible for sinful men and women to be holy. And this, dear friends, is the very heart and center of the gospel. It's what our business is while we are on this planet. To let men and women know that though everybody's a sinner and nobody can ever be good enough to to please God, God has intervened. And he did that on a cross back on Calvary. You were thinking about it last weekend. He did that on a cross. The only innocent man in history publicly declared not to be a sinner by the Roman authorities was crucified and chose to allow it to happen. Why? That there might be salvation for you and for me. And so, as we go back into this high high priestly prayer, understand that all that Jesus is praying for is based upon the argument that I gave my life as a ransom for many. Now, I do need to get you chronologically geared up. This is actually the, the day before he's executed. But he's looking into the future. He's setting the parameter. That if anybody is ever going to be holy, something needs to be done to take away their sin. One of the reasons you have a whole Bible is to show you that while there were some really good people in the Bible's history, none of them were perfect. It's a record of human failure. And so you're brought to the point where Jesus comes. Nobody could accuse him of sin. And so he died as an innocent man. When John the Baptist saw him, he gave us insight into this. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That should take you right back into the heart of the Old Testament. What's this reference to a Lamb of God? It goes back particularly to the time of Moses and the exodus from Egypt. When the Israelites were about to leave, they were told to take an innocent lamb, a perfect lamb, to kill it and put its blood on the doorposts. So that when God's judgment descended on it in Egypt, they would be spared. So when John the Baptist says, behold the lamb of God, he's underlining this word that Jesus is used because that lamb had to be consecrated for that sacrifice. It was tested, it was examined and when it was found to be perfect at the right moment it lost its life and became a substitute for the person who offered it. Jesus consecrated himself 
You'll be familiar with these words from Isaiah 53. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shearer is silent. He opened not his mouth. Let's remember he's the Lord of glory. He could at any moment have summoned a whole legion of angels, he said. He could have said, I've had enough. This is a farce. But he didn't. Step by deliberate step. No man takes my life from me. I lay it down of myself. And I have permission to do so. That's what it means to be consecrated. That's what it means when it describes Jesus as having been sanctified in verse 19. In the Old Testament, the high priest took a lamb once a year, shed its blood, and then took it into what was called the Holy of Holies, where he made atonement or covered over the sins of God's people, that they might live in his presence. Jesus in the Bible is both the high priest and the sacrifice. And as such, he is what the Bible calls the mediator or the, the go-between. Between God and men. He is the fulfillment of all that had been delivered to Moses and all that the Old Testament spoke about. I love that passage in Luke's gospel where the, the disciples are despondent after the resurrection. They don't know he's alive and he meets them on the road and it says he took them back through Moses and all the prophets. You know how it goes on? And showed them how it talked about him. So the whole Old Testament, while, a, while a, an incredible book of history, is not only a book of history... It is, in fact, an introduction to Jesus. And there he was, in due time, born of a woman, born under the law, says Paul to the Galatians, so that he might become that sacrifice and through his sacrifice make that perfect atonement for sin. The book of Hebrews expands the whole theme. In fact, it is the theme of the book, isn't it? Just one little place. Hebrews 9, 11, Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. That, dear friends, is the deliberate choice of God for their sakes. Who are they? Well, back earlier in the chapter, we considered that um, incredible doctrine of election where God gave to Christ a multitude which no man can number from every tribe and tongue and nation and appointed that they would be saved through the death of Christ and they would hear of it through the Holy Spirit and be brought to trust him for their sakes. I consecrate myself. I sanctify myself. Dear friends, one of the great challenges of our Christian faith is we get so familiar with talking about Jesus dying that we glaze over when we look at it. We need help from God to take away the cataracts that time produces. And to focus in afresh on the wonder and incredible truth that God demonstrates his own love towards us. And that while we were yet sinners, notice he didn't put us on a self-improvement course. In that we, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For their sakes, I sanctify myself. I've got written in my notes now that we should pause and be silent. 
For truly, the only appropriate response to what we've read is worship. He loved me, says Paul. He gave himself for me. So now the life that I live, I live for the Son of God. I've transposed the words, but you know where I'm coming from. And I challenge you this morning about your response as I challenge myself. Am I a worshipper? Because if you are one of those for whose sake Christ sanctified himself, then your heart will be swelling to bursting with thanksgiving. Oh, Father, forgive me for, for the carelessness with which we handle these things. I said before, one of our hindrances as reformed types of congregations is the, the failure to shout hallelujah. You'll get no protest from up here. If you go over the top, I'll speak to you later. But you'll get no protest because that surely is what we're all about. This is awesome. And I would even say, if your heart's not being warmed by this, then you are in need of spiritual attention. I referred to the disciples on the road to Emmaus when Jesus met with them. He meets with them initially and then departs, doesn't he? And as they're talking about it, they say, our hearts were strangely warmed. I pray today God is warming your heart. Because it's only with a warm heart that you're equipped to go back out there. And make any kind of significant difference. Stand with me this morning for a moment then. On the vantage point of Calvary. Cowering above humanity. See what Jesus saw. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. There are seven sayings. I won't go through them all, but to the last one. It is finished. What is finished? Your redemption and mine. And at that moment in time, this incredible transformation is put on the pages of history and it becomes a reality for the individual when they come to faith in Christ and say, Lord, save me. And you're never the same again. You don't always live on the mountain peaks. Most of us have to spend lots of time in the valley. But it's because of the mountain peak that you can survive. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Everybody knows Psalm 23, don't they? You are with me. No, never alone, says one of the hymn writers. Oh, dear friends, can you see it? The tragedy of unbelief is they don't see it. And if there's anybody here who's not a Christian, that's where you lack. You'll notice I'm getting on in years. I can remember when television was first introduced. I lived in a little village called Straighton. And Mrs. Lamb had a television. She was the first in the village. And at 10 minutes to 5, we all piled into our house, all the children, that is, to see Watch With Mother. But it was on a tiny 7 or 9 inch screen. And you know what, boys and girls? It was black and white. And we only had black and white television for years. In fact, it wasn't until Kath and I got married in the 1970s that we got color television. I want to use that to illustrate where the unbeliever is. Effectively, all they see is life in black and white. But once you understand that he, he sanctified himself for your sake and you believe in him as your savior, it's like the day color television began. Even back then, it was a great thing to have a color TV and go to work and tell your workmates, we've got a color TV. 
Now it's all just taken for granted if you watch it at all. That's the difference between a believer and an unbeliever, or that's an illustration of the difference. And once you've come to the vantage point, there's no going back. You might see an old watch with mother in black and white, and you'll laugh at it because it looks so strange, doesn't it? And you wouldn't want to go back there, and so it is for the believer. We go forward, trusting this Savior. Let me go further into Jesus' prayer. Way back in verse 17, Jesus prays, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And at the end of verse 19, that they also may be sanctified by your truth. Sanctification is effected through the death of Christ on the cross when it's applied to the believer. But then it becomes the life business of every believer. There's not a day when sanctification or holiness is not important. It's a declaration when you come to faith. And it's a process that, that identifies the whole life of faith. Jesus is praying. In verses 14 and 15, he prays that his followers will be kept from Satan and the evil one. It's negative. In verse 17, in the end of verse 19, he's praying positively. And let's understand that holiness is positive. It's an improvement. Too often from our history, we've seen people who are, who, who are pursuing holiness as being the most doer, miserable souls you can find. I'm not there. I may be Scottish, but I'm not entirely there. I think holiness is exciting. Because it's a, a powerful tool of God where day by day we are, we are growing, we are developing, we, are, we, we, we understand that even when we slip back, we have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ, the righteous. So that while my journey is not a straight line, when there are dips, when I fall headlong, says the psalmist, or when I fall, I will not fall headlong, for the Lord upholds me with his hand. Psalm 37, verse 24. I will not fall headlong. The Lord lifts us up and puts us back because this is your life as a Christian. It's the business of becoming holy. It's why God saved you. He didn't save you so you could have an insurance certificate to present at the gates of heaven which says on such and such a date you made a profession of faith. He saved you to be holy. Romans 8, 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined, now listen to the words, to be conformed to the image of his son. That's why God saved you, to be conformed to the image of his son, to become like Jesus. As I said, I was asked, how do I know what the will of God is? There are places in the Bible where it's there in black and white. There are places in the Bible where you don't get room to miss it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3 and again in chapter 5, Paul says to the Thessalonians, for this is the will of God. It's a challenge. Can you finish it? Don't you want to know what God's will is for your life? Don't you want to know what God has appointed as your number one priority? For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. That sort of puts it on the priority list, does it not? That's more important than everything else I do in life. Even your sanctification. Or 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all, with unveiled face, beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image 
from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. The, the, this Christianity is the most exciting, dramatic experience that any human being can have. Because he takes sinners and then he calls them saints. The Apostle Paul, when he's writing to the churches, he writes to the saints. Ah. And then as you read through the letter, you think this is some bunch of ruffians. He's having to sort out this and that. But it's expressing this wonderful truth. That when a man or woman comes through faith in Christ into a living relationship with God, they have been made holy and are being made holy. And we're saints. Set apart from the world. If you've read this chapter at all, you'll notice that what Paul says in verse 14, he repeats in verse 16. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. We're different. We're different. We march to a different drummer. Our priorities are distinct. Yes, develop your gifts, opportunities, and your whatever else to the fullest extent you can do so. That's your responsibility. But always under the umbrella of holiness. Why? Without holiness. No man, woman, boy or girl, will see the Lord. He's holy, remember? The only time we get a picture of God's attributes repeated is in Isaiah chapter 6. And what is it? Holy, holy, holy. The Bible never says God is love, love, love. That was the Beatles. Holy. Holy, holy. And if I'm going to spend eternity with God, I need to be holy. How am I to be holy? Because Jesus died for me and Jesus prays that I will develop in holiness. He's speaking to his father. Make them holy by your truth. Change them. Transform them. Work in them, both to will and to do according to your good pleasure. Philippians 2, 13. I love those verses. Work in them, both to will, that's to make them want to, and to bring to pass to do according to your good pleasure. Oh, friends, this is the God of the Bible. This is the God who gave Christ to die for us. This is the God who listens to Jesus' argument. Sanctify them by your truth. Make them holy. And God works in our lives. You see, when you become a Christian, how can you put it? There's no going back. The Bible is quite clear. If somebody says they're a Christian and goes back, they were never a Christian. The distinctive mark of a Christian is that they persevere. Uphill, downhill. And God is day and daily working all things together for good. You've used that verse, haven't you? Romans 8. Working all things together for good. Do you ever stop and ask what the good is? You might imagine some lesser thing in your family or your circumstances. But the good that God's going to do for you is make you ready for heaven. It's going to make you holy. And I love this chapter because this is the Lord's prayer. I'm told in my Bible that he ever lives to make intercession for me. And I don't think therefore I'm wrong when I say when I read this, I get a picture of what Jesus is doing right now. He's praying that you and I will be holy. That means there'll be challenges. We did the book of James some months ago, didn't we? I were told to rejoice in our trials. And I tried to suggest that the, the trials God allows into our lives are like going to the gymnasium. They're designed to make us stronger. 
but they can become temptations when you begin to complain about them. And that in this world, there will always be trials. It's not that God's sort of trying to punish you for something. He may be trying to correct you. I need to be careful there. But trials in general are not punishments. They're challenges, stepping stones for us to grow by. And I can guarantee you, as you go into this week, things are going to happen where you're going to think, I don't want this. I hope there's also times when you're saying, yeah, whoa, this is great. But look at those trials through the lens of what God is doing to make you holy. Because when you come into a trial, and the danger here is to oversimplify, bear with me, when you come into a trial, it's supposed to turn you to the Father. He's our life coach. The Holy Spirit dwells with us to train us, to develop us. And so we have here this instruction of how the Holy Spirit does it, by God's word. And that's why little churches like ours persist on preaching the Bible. I don't have any tips to come from any other book. Tips is not a good word, but you know what I mean. You get all these, you'll be bombarded with adverts like I am. So-and-so will tell you the secret to conquering this, that, or the next thing. And after a 30-minute video, they'll say, now, send us your money. God uses trials to develop the muscle of faith. And faith then is to work trusting him even in the trials. There are other times when you're in the company of believers and you're hearing the word preached and as you've been taken to Calvary, you go, wow, yeah, hallelujah. See, I say it sometimes. And those are the peaks. But living in this world, you have to understand that it's God's plan and purpose to make you like Jesus. Somebody asked the sculptor once who had been appointed to make a bear. He says, and he looked at the block of granite and he says, how do you make that block of granite into a bear? And he says, I just chip away everything that isn't a bear. That's God's work in my life and in yours. Every circumstance is designed to bring us in to a fuller, sweeter relationship to God. And can I just emphasize again for the unbeliever, it's not optional. If you're not a Christian today, you need to get this sorted out immediately. Because there's a day coming when the world will end and God will, will, will divide humanity into sheep and goats. And only the sheep go in. And one of the functions of preaching is today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Run to him. He's standing with his arms stretched wide on the cross. Come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Many years ago, I went to a wedding in Inverness. It was after I had finished attending BTI in Glasgow and the, 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 the young woman who was the female president, I had the honor of being the male one, was getting married and I was invited to her, her wedding. Most of you are English, but some are not. If you've ever been to the free church, you know that it's a very formal kind of place. It was toasting. Yes, they do get very hot days in Inverness. And so instead of going with a suit, I bought a pair of slacks and a new shirt, and I went in my shirt sleeves. I was so out of place, it was unbelievable. What made it worse was at the reception, Chris Ann asked me to say grace. Grace. 
my embarrassment that day was soon over. But if you arrive at the presence of God without holiness, you will not be dressed for the occasion. And there's no part in it for you. Let me just go to my last point. I told you I always run out of time. But let me just point you to a purpose for this holiness. Verse 18. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Run back again to verse 50. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. Jesus' mission was to come into an alien world and declare the kingdom of God, to preach that men and women should repent and believe, to then go to Calvary, to die to save his people. But God's plan didn't stop there. God's plan is to take ordinary believers and put them out into the world so that they could meet Jesus in us. Are your knees knocking? Mine are. What a, what a privilege. What a responsibility. When I got converted, I wanted to find somewhere private and leave the world to go down its tubes. It would be handy. I, I could have joined a monastery or a nunnery and just excluded myself. But that's not biblical. The whole purpose of sanctification, and this to me as I was studying was almost a revelation, has a third aspect that I've not come across in theology books. And the third aspect is that God would put us as a catalyst into a dead, dying world. So that men and women would no longer have any excuse for saying there is no God. Or that God isn't good. Remember Jesus' words, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? If it is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under foot by men, you are the light of the world. That was God's plan, is God's plan. That, dear friends, and I hope it doesn't shock you too much, is how Jesus is praying for you now. He wants you and me out there. It's great to come to church and meet with a bunch of like-minded people. God's designed that for our encouragement. But it's like having your batteries charged so that they will be discharged in the world around you. It doesn't mean you've got to be banging on about Christianity. But it does mean you have to live a different life, a holy life. It does mean that when you come to weighing up what's right and wrong, God's word tells you. Not society. It's a good job time's running out. I could really go off on this one. God's word is the standard and pattern for the Christian life. And it will mean that there are times when you have to take a stand. I hope you have the grace to do it with humility. But it's for a purpose. When I used to work in ICI in Grangemouth, I gave a man a lift to work every day, Ned Tinlin. He was the very opposite of me, long hair. This is way back in the 70s. And he was into marijuana. We talked often in the car. And if I gave him a Christian tract, he would give me a leaflet recommending marijuana. I really... I prayed for that man and had lost hope. I wasn't down here very long before the telephone rang. And lo and behold, it was Ned Tinlin. I've become a believer. He says, all those conversations we were having, you never realized how God was using them. That's God's plan. Where are you tomorrow? Who are you rubbing shoulders with? I hope it's more than just the people you like. I hope there's some of them. But God's put you where you are for a purpose. As you sent me into the world, 
I also have sent them into the world. Oh dear, 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 I need to stop. Let me just underline again that you have been made holy and left here to show the world what God is like, to remind the world of, of, of God's great love. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, that's you and me, friends, by the mercies of God, that's because he saved us, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And this is what I wanted to get to, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Will of God. History has shown us time and again how God has transformed the world with very simple people. Around these parts, Thomas Langton, I keep banging on about him, was used immensely. He was a farrier. He wasn't a great statesman, but he trampled these moors with the gospel. And God honoured it. 2,000 converted in Rosedale. I doubt there's that many people live there now. But that's how God works. You and I are here for that purpose. I'm right back to the beginning then. What is your number one priority? What is your number one priority? It is... To be holy, surely, and to live for the glory of God because of Jesus' sacrifice, because Jesus is praying for it, and you are part of Jesus' mission. Amen. What do you sing after a sermon on that subject? Well, there, for me, there's only one hymn Take time to be holy, speak. Notice the order, speak oft with your Lord. Number 742.
Precious Father, we thank you for the privilege of being made holy. We confess we struggle with being made holy. But we thank you for your love and your persistence and your kindness. And then for the opportunity to go back into the world and to let them see you in us. May it be our joy and delight for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.